second part of our course has to do with the rise of logical positivism after World War I and its demise in the 1950s and 60s especially. The demise involves epistemological issues in the 1950s and more metaphysical issues culminating in the work of Saul Kripke in the late 1960s. Let's start though first with positivistic epistemology. So what I'm going to do in these lectures is give a very brief high-level overview of positivistic epistemology first, then we'll turn to the work of A.J. Ayer, who's sort of the popularizer of positivistic views in his book from the 1930s, Language, Truth, and Logic. After doing these introductory lectures about positivistic epistemology and its primary spokesman, at least at a more popular level, Ayer is not really the spokesman for the group. He's in England, and the rise of positivism occurred in Europe, especially in Vienna and Berlin. And the most important figures don't include British philosophers at the beginning. By the time we get to the 1930s, Ayer comes to play a more significant role because he writes language, truth, and logic. But we'll look at the details of the history once we get some better idea of the content of the view and Ayer's particular popularizing characterization of what it involves. So first, as to positivistic epistemology, positivism is deeply empirical. It's a 20th century offspring of the empiricist tradition that goes back to Locke, Berkeley, and Hume. So, in particular, positivists divide knowledge into two significant differences in terms of the analytic-synthetic distinction. Synthetic claims are not ones that are true in virtue of the meaning of the terms, as are analytic claims. So notice this is a semantic distinction. Fundamentally, it's about whether a sentence is true in virtue of the meanings of the terms or not. If it's true in virtue of the meanings of the terms, you don't need to do natural science in order to determine whether the statement is true or not. Synthetic statements are ones that are not true in virtue of the meanings of the terms, not neither true nor false in virtue of meaning, and hence have to be empirically confirmable or disconfirmable. Notice here the empiricism of the view. Synthetic statements, we start with a semantic characterization that synthetic is not analytic, and then we quickly introduce an epistemological criterion. Notice that the epistemological criterion is not contained in the semantic notion itself. It's something that you add on later to it hoping that the two are connected in some ways. So suppose you start with this view. Are there any particular obstacles to accepting it? And the answer is yes. Initially, such an epistemology gives rise to three primary problematic areas. Mathematical truths are neither confirmable nor disconfirmable by experience, so what are you gonna say about them? There are necessary truths that may not be logical truths. So think about the Wittgensteinian, the early Wittgensteinian view that we can explain all of necessity in terms of tautologies and self-contradictions. Ramsey worried about sentences like nothing can be both red and green all over, which are necessary but aren't necessary in virtue of meaning alone. So what are we going to do about those? And then a third area is take things that are supposed to be knowable a priori. Things like jo uh, Bishop Joseph Butler's uh, dictum that everything is what it is and not another thing. It doesn't take experience to confirm that everything is identical to itself. So what are we going to do with these sorts of things? So we get mathematical truths, we get necessary truths, and what are we going to say about the distinction between a priori and a posteriori? Positivistic epistemology 
contains answers to each of these problematic areas. So the positivistic solution says, necessity is to be found in the way we talk, not in things themselves. So the only kind of necessity that there is or could be is necessity in virtue of analyticity. That imposes a burden on you because now you have to claim that all mathematical truths are analytic. They're true in virtue of the meanings of the terms. The reason that's a burden is because what, what's true in virtue of the meanings of the terms looks like something that is superficial and easy to detect. All bachelors are unmarried is true and presumably true in virtue of the meanings of the terms, but it doesn't take a lot of work to show or come to the conclusion that it's true in virtue of the meanings of the terms. But there are lots of mathematical claims that you look at them and you just can't tell whether they're true or false. And sometimes it takes centuries before mathematicians can figure out how to show that a claim is true or that it's false. How does that comport with the claim that these are true in virtue of the meanings of the terms? Don't we know what the terms mean? Are we ignorant in the dark about the language we speak? Those are hard questions, but in any case, the positivistic theory, positivistic epistemology requires endorsing this linguistic theory of necessity. Necessity resides in words, not in things. Second, the a priori is identified with analyticity. So we get the following nice, elegant, simple little table for positivists. The green area identifies analyticity with necessity with a priority. The pink area identifies syn the synthetic with the contingent and with the a posteriori, what can be known by a, through experience or what needs to be known through experience. The a priori perhaps can be known through experience, but fundamentally it's known independently of experience. So for example, your math teachers can tell you that some claims are theorems, and you can come to know that they're theorems on the basis of testimony. But the fundamental way in which we discover that they're theorems is not through testimony, but through proofs, mathematical proofs. Notice then we have three things. We have a linguistic or semantic distinction we have a metaphysical distinction between necessity and contingency, and we have an epistemological distinction between what's knowable independently of experience and what isn't knowable independently of experience. The simplicity of positivistic epistemology is simply to identify these three sets of distinctions. The implications of this are pretty significant. The empirical, what's knowable through experience, is what the sciences investigate or can investigate, and this causes a bit of anxiety, intellectual anxiety among philosophers at the time, and it continues to this day. What is philosophy doing? What are we doing when we reflect philosophically on various topics or issues on the nature of reality, whether or not knowledge is possible, what goes into living a good life, what's the right thing to do, what kind of human rights are there, what are we doing when we reflect on all of those areas? Philosophy can't be giving you a special branch of knowledge because it's not a science. So the question is, what are we doing in philosophy that makes for respectability of any sort at all. And the positivist answer is the task of philosophy must be wholly critical or analytic. Its task is to characterize, clarify, or analyze language. So lots of bad thinking happens because people aren't clear enough about what the meanings of terms are and that sort of thing. And so the role of the philosopher is to make things clear and perspicuous, and to call out scientists and mathematicians who are being sloppy. That's a very limited kind of role. Go back to Plato and Aristotle 
and their accounts of reality and what goes into reality as a whole. Metaphysics in its broadest, widest sense, they were trying to characterize what the nature of reality is. That turns out to be a meaningless project, something that can't be carried out, something that involves philosophers stepping beyond what they're capable of providing. You can hear some echoes of early Wittgenstein here because he kept saying what he was trying to do was characterize the bounds of thought, what you can think about and what you can't think about, and not to get confused between the two. So one of the themes of the Tractatus shows up here in positivistic epistemology. Central to positive positivistic epistemology is then the principle of verification. And we'll see this particular little chart play out in Ayer's language, truth and logic. In fact, it's taken from there. So Ayer starts out with A here, which he calls a vague account of the principle of verification. So what we're going to do is try to carve off sentences that are empirically or factually significant from those that aren't. A project that Wittgenstein's Tractatus was engaged in as well. So we want to say when a sentence is factually significant so that we can throw out all the ones that aren't factually significant. The vague account starts with this idea of a person knowing how to verify a proposition. And then Ayer says, well, there's a couple of ambiguities going on here. Do you know in practice how to verify a claim? Or do you know in practice how to confirm a claim? So notice verification is a stronger term than confirmation. To verify is to something like to conclusively confirm, whereas to confirm is to perhaps give some evidence in favor of. In any case, there's this ambiguity between verification and confirmation. Actually, it's not an ambiguity because A is clearly formulated in the language of verification, but you can imagine weakening this. So you say, well, I can't verify it, but I can confirm it. The reason for this distinction, by the way, has to do with universal generalizations and negative existentials. So a universal generalization, all ravens are black. How do you verify that? There's a bit of a skeptical worry that you can't ever get enough information to conclude this, or how do you show that Santa Claus doesn't exist? How do you verify it? How do you conclusively establish a negative existential? So they were a bit worried about that. And so you might say, well, okay, I'm a, I have enough skeptical concerns so that I'm inclined not to rely on the language of verification anymore. Perhaps we should content ourselves with incremental confirmation. We can get some evidence in favor of the claim that there is no Santa Claus or that all ravens are black, even if we can't conclusively establish those claims. Okay, so skeptical worries might make you substitute a weaker notion for verification. The other thing is the distinction between knowing in principle and knowing in practice. Do you know in principle how to verify or confirm a proposition? On this score, first, this is supposed to be a vague account and Ayer wants to replace it with something more precise, which shows up in B, C, and D. B is something more precise that Ayer doesn't like. C and D are his preferred directions for characterizing what it is for a sentence to be factually significant. On the knowing how in principle or in practice, here's an interesting anecdote. One of the most famous physicists in the last part of the 20th century was Richard Feynman, Feynman is famous for a number of different things, but in any case, near the end of his life, he was working on quantum mechanics. He did a PBS series on quantum mechanics. Maybe, it were, maybe they were interviews in which he said near the end of the episode that I was watching that he was going to spend the next five years working on quantum mechanics to try to figure out what its empirical implications actually are. 
He understood the theory certainly better than any of us do. So he did understand the theory and assumed that it was factually significant. But ask yourself, when he makes a remark like he did, does he know in practice how to verify the propositions empirically? Obviously not. He can't tell what the empirical implications are. Does he know in principle how to verify? It sounds like he said he doesn't. So in any case, the vague accounts may run up against the Feynman counterexample, though that's not quite certain to me, but it looks like they're all incompatible with Feynman admitting that he doesn't know what the empirical implications of quantum mechanics is, even though it's very clear that he understands the theory. All right, so suppose you don't want this vague, imprecise account and you want, to be, you want to be offering something more substantive. The first thing to do is when people went from verification to a weaker notion of confirmation, one of the first moves in between those two is to move to falsification instead of verification. So for universal generalization, suppose you're worried that you can't conclusively verify that all ravens are black. Popper said, Popper was a physicist, but he said, oh, we can solve that problem because even if you can't conclusively verify, you can refute. You know what it takes to refute that all ravens are black. Just find a raven that's not black. So the problem goes away. And the same thing for negative existentials. Even if you can't conclusively confirm that there is no Santa Claus, you can refute it by producing Santa Claus. Okay, so Popper's idea was all of the problems with verificationism can be eliminated if we just turn to falsificationism instead. The problem is that there are mirror sets of problems. Negative existentials and universal generalizations are problems for verificationism. Problems is probably too strong. There are question marks that arise for conclusive verificationism that come from universal generalizations and negative existentials. But if you turn to falsification, just consider positive existentials. How do you refute the claim that unicorns exist? Well, that's not any easier than conclusively confirming that all ravens are black. Refuting an existential claim is just as troubling as verifying a universal generalization. Moreover, universal generalizations, this is an A proposition I'm thinking of for Aristotelian logic, but there's also the no SRP ones. How do you refute that no SRP? Well, that's pretty easy. Okay, so you've got an existential claim. Let's cut out some of this. I think I'm meandering. The general point to worry about if you make this move from verificationism to falsificationism is this. If there's an epistemological problem for conclusively verifying that all ravens are black, universal generalizations, or negative existentials, there's going to be a similar logical epistemological problem for falsification in terms of existential statements themselves. If negative existentials can't be conclusively confirmed, then existential statements can't be decisively falsified either. And similarly for generalizations. All ravens are black. If that one can't be conclusively verified, then take the sentence, some ravens are not black. How do you falsify that? It looks like verification and falsification are mirror images of each other in terms of just negating the sentences that you started with. So if you have problems of verification for certain kinds of sentences, negate those sentences and you should have a problem for falsifying those as well. So the Popper 
proposal of substituting falsification for verification doesn't seem like it's going to advance the discussion very much. So Ayer moves past it, and he moves past it in the following way, along the following lines of thought. You talk about some entailment or deduction requirement so that there is an experiential proposition which can be deduced from the proposition that you started with in conjunction with other premises without being deducible from those other premises alone. So the idea here is you're hoping that confirmation is the mirror image of entailment. So the way you tell whether or not one piece, one experience or whatever confirms a given proposition, you try to figure out whether the proposition being confirmed entails that experience. I think of this as the high school account of the scientific method. Figure out what the theoretical claim that you're trying to confirm, what the hypothesis you're trying to confirm entails, and then look to see if the entailment holds. Look, I'm sorry, look to see if the entailed proposition is true. The reason I call this the high school understanding of the scientific method is because, as we will learn later on this semester, entailment is just way too strong here. The fact is, theoretical hypotheses never entail anything about experience, or at least hardly ever do. The truth that the high school model points to is the idea that confirmation is the mirror of prediction. Confirmation mirrors prediction. So if you're trying to confirm a theoretical hypothesis, what you do is you see what the theory predicts or what the hypothesis predicts in terms of experience. Then you run the test to see if the prediction is true or not. If the prediction is true, the fact that the hypothesis or theory predicted that shows that the experience, which you learned, confirms. That's reasonable to endorse. But prediction, one kind of, one kind of prediction is entailment, but it's not the only kind. You can have predictions that are weaker than entailments. Prediction is essentially an epistemological notion not a logical one. In any case, this is the form of the principle of verification that we see discussed in language, truth, and logic. Lots of precisifying to try to get the formula exactly right. So you're looking at what can be deduced in terms of an experiential proposition, and then you have to define that notion in terms of actual or possible observation. After proposing something like this, Ayer recognizes that there are two kinds of verifiability, direct and indirect. It's directly verifiable if, it either, if it's either itself an observation statement or entails one. It's indirectly verifiable if and only if in conjunction with certain other premises, it entails one or more directly verifiable statements, which aren't deducible from these other statements alone. And these other premises don't include any statement that is not either analytic or directly verifiable or capable of being established as indirectly verifiable. You can see what's going on here. You want more and more theoretical statements that are more distant from observation statements to turn out to be verifiable. So you build a hierarchy where you have to be able to trace higher level statements down to a bottom level, but they don't have to, they don't have to be characterized in terms of a two-tier structure. You can have as many tiers as you want, so long as it all traces back to the lower one. Okay, that's a brief
big picture overview of positivistic epistemology plus the troubling principle of verification that it all depends on. Now, the principle of verification that it all depends on, I say, is troubling because one of the early worries about verificationism is about these statements of the principle itself. It doesn't matter which one you pick, but in a public debate between A.J. Ayer and Frederick Copleston, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but there's this really enormous history of philosophy that Copleston wrote. I don't know exactly how many volumes it is, but it's more than 30 volumes. He spent his life working on that. In any case, he's a priest, and so they had uh, a BBC debate between Copleston and Ayer on positivism and its connection to religious belief in particular. But one of the things Copleston did in the debate was he asked about the status of the principle itself. Is this principle analytic or is it synthetic? If it's synthetic, you'd have to be able to say what evidence would count in favor of it. And it doesn't look like it's that kind of a proposal. So it looks like this remark is supposed to be analytic or take whichever favored alternative you want to it. If you like V3 or V4 in either of its forms, pick whichever one you want and now try to explain to us why this is true in virtue of the meanings of the terms alone. It certainly doesn't seem to be like all bachelors are unmarried. All you have to do is understand those terms and you can see that the sentence is true. But here I understand what it is for something to be a sentence, a fact, what it is for something to be factually significant. I, under, I sort of have a grasp of what that's about. These aren't words I'm unfamiliar with. I understand the language of experience. I know what experience is. I know what deduction is. You can go through and look at each of the terms being used in each of these proposals, and you probably understand all of them. It's not like you need a dictionary to look things up. But can you tell immediately and directly that the claim is true? It's embarrassing for positivists to have to admit, but they had to admit it's not trivially true, their principle of verification. Otherwise, people wouldn't be disputing it. So how is it that it's analytic? In any case, that's the troubling nature of the principle of verification. There are other problems with it as well, but that's at least the first one that ought to be addressed if you're going to move on with verificationism or the positivistic epistemology connected to it. Let's turn then to Ayer's actual work and look at it. So then let's look at Ayer's discussion, especially with respect to the status of metaphysics. What language, truth, and logic does is it introduces positivistic epistemology, identifying analyticity, necessity, and a prioricity and then it draws implications for these. The major implications have to do with religion, religious language, metaphysics, and ethics. If you endorse the empiricist criterion of meaning, the principle of verification in some form or other, it turns out that, as Ayer points out, there's some parts of language that are in trouble. The first one is religious language. The truth or falsity of theism is not a factually significant claim, according to Ayer. It's meaningless, so all of theology gets thrown out. The people that were working on these issues and topics and were doing this sort of work tended not to be theists in the first place, so there wasn't a lot of troubled brows, furrowed brows about this result. Religion could be thrown out and nobody seemed to be bothered very much like it. Maybe ordinary people in the street would be bothered by this implication, but the philosophers presenting the view weren't bothered by it. A second region that was thrown out was speculative metaphysics, and that's the chapter that we're going to talk about here. In any case, that didn't bother these people very much. Empiricists in general tend to be suspicious of substantive metaphysics. So the fact that Ayer throws it out didn't cause a whole lot of 
consternation among philosophers. It did raise this anxiety level about what we're doing, what philosophers might be doing that might be significant, but they thought they had an answer to that. They were analysts. So that, that was fine. The third area that got thrown out bothered people. It was ethics. When we get to the rise of positivism in the Vienna Circle and in Berlin, one of the things we'll notice is the fundamental social and political motivations for the view. They thought it was essential that science be respected in order to get decent public policy proposals. And so they were searching for a way to explain why science was singularly respectable when it came to intellectual matters so that the public policy decisions being made in Austria and other parts of Europe could be firmly grounded in empirical information. Well, if it turns out in the process of doing this that you end up saying every normative judgment, every ethical, political, social remark about what should be done or what would be best to do, if those turn out all to be meaningless, the motivations conflict with the endpoint that you came to, the theory you developed would end up implying, it looks like, that there's no way of a well-grounded social or political policy that could be obtained because no matter what you propose, it's all meaningless. Okay, so the third part about ethics turned out to be more problematic, but we're not going to talk about that one as much. We're going to talk first about the elimination of metaphysics to see how this rejection of metaphysics, religious language, and ethical thought and talk proceeds. So first, Ayer presents an epistemological challenge to metaphysics. So go read your favorite metaphysician. Maybe it's Leibniz. Leibniz and his talk about monads. Maybe it's Hegel and his talk about absolute spirits. Maybe it's Spinoza and his pantheism. Who knows? But you get these grand metaphysical systems that philosophers construct to tell you what all of reality is like. In the 20th century, maybe you get Whitehead, that everything is process and everything in the universe is mental in some sense or other. Maybe you get that absolute idealism of, say, Bradley or other 19th century thinkers. Ayer thinks there's a challenge to all of them. One way of attacking a metaphysician who claimed to have knowledge of a reality which transcended the phenomenal world would be to inquire from what premises his propositions were deduced. Must he not begin, as other men do, with the evidence of the senses? And if so, what valid process of reasoning can possibly lead him to the conception of a transcendent reality? Surely, you, know, you gotta love it when a philosopher uses, surely. In any case, surely from empirical premises, nothing whatsoever concerning the properties or even the existence of anything super empirical can legitimately be inferred. So transcendental metaphysics posits things that go beyond what can be demonstrated from experience. So, some questions to ask about this. Notice the unrelenting empiricism. What have you got to go on other than the evidence of the senses? That needs a defense. But let's suppose you can give one. Let's suppose we're all on board with the, with the empiricism in question. Notice the second assumption. The second assumption is that if you're going to get to something super empirical, Whatever you get to has to be gotten to by deduction. Notice his talk about valid processes of reasoning. Perhaps he doesn't mean the contemporary notion of validity, but if not, it's not clear because he explicitly talks about deduction. How does the deduction go, he wants to know. Well, maybe it the right question is, why are we talking about deduction? Why, for example, can't we talk about, say, inference to the best explanation? So notice what Ayer does in this very passage. He concludes it with talk about what can legitimately be inferred, and for that, you might think 
inferences to the best explanation, that's a pretty legitimate form of inference. But earlier on, he made clear that the kind of legitimate inference there could be had to be a deductive one. So, why deduction? In any case, Air grants that this line of attack isn't going to be compelling enough. He grants that at best it can only show that metaphysics is epistemically ungrounded. All right, now let's stop right there for a moment and notice that there's a worry that this um, challenge to metaphysics will also be a challenge to modern science. Because one of the things that's commonly recognized is that every theory outruns our data for it. Every theory outruns the data. So for example, suppose, suppose Ayer were right that you can deduce observational statements from theories. Let's suppose you can do that. So let's conjoin all of them. Conjoin all of the observational consequences of a given theory. Still, it's commonly recognized the theory is logically stronger than the conjunction of all of its empirical consequences. Now suppose that's true. If it weren't true, you'd just view theories as a shorthand description for the conjunction of all of the empirical consequences of the theory. But theories outrun their empirical consequences. You use the empirical consequences to confirm or disconfirm the theory, but the theory is stronger than that. Notice then that what Ayer complains about with respect to metaphysics is also a complaint that would attach to theories. Tell me how this deduction of something stronger than the logical conjunction of all the consequences is supposed to be, supposed to go. The theory will be super empirical. So, and this is a problem that plagues positivists throughout its history. You have to be very careful when you start aiming your guns at the metaphysician that you don't also take out the scientists. In general, that problem recurs. They would say what they had to say, thinking about the metaphysicians, and then somebody would point out, oh crap, cosmology goes out the window too if you do this. Or, oh crap, physics, contemporary physics is lost as well. That turned out to be a recurring embarrassment. But in any case, Air grants, oh, this above line of attack is only going to show metaphysicians to be epistemically suspect. He wants something more. What's required is rather a criticism of the nature of the actual statements which comprise it, it being metaphysics. And this is the line of argument which we shall in fact pursue. For we shall maintain that no statement which refers to a reality transcending the limits of all possible sense experience can possibly have any literal significance, from which it must follow that the labors of those who have striven to describe such a reality have all been devoted to the production of nonsense. So when you think when you hear the word nonsense in air, you should think about noises that people make that have no semantic significance at all. Think about coughs. Think about clearing your throat. Think about the words, the noises we make when we get stuck in the middle of a sentence. The ums and ahs and those sorts of things where noises are coming out, but there's nothing being said through the noises that are being made. Air thinks that's what all of metaphysics is doing. It is nothing but the production of nonsense. So how are we going to do this? How are we going to show this? Well, we're going to take a look at the actual statements that are being made. And in order to throw them all in the garbage heap, 
we need only formulate. We need only formulate the criterion which enables us to test whether a sentence says anything, whether it expresses a genuine proposition about a matter of fact, and then point out that the sentences of the metaphysicians don't do that. That's when he turns to the verification principle that I talked about earlier. So first you start with what he calls the vague formulation, which he puts in terms of know-how, knowing how to verify or confirm. He then distinguishes between practical and in principle verifiability, and also between strong and weak. The difference between what's conclusively established by experience versus what is rendered probable. And then we note the kinds of problems that we have. Universal generalizations and negative existentials are hard to conclusively establish. And then he's a fallibilist. He endorses a kind of fallibilism, which seems like a relatively common sense position to hold. Indeed, it will be our contention that no proposition other than astrology can possibly be anything more than a probable hypothesis. So you better not go for the stronger conclusively established by experience form of the principle, because otherwise hardly anything will turn out to be cognitively significant or factually significant. Then he considers falsificationism, nor can we accept the suggestion that a sentence should be allowed to be factually significant if and only if it expresses something which is definitely confutable by experience. The argument he uses appeals to the holistic character of refutation, for when we take the occurrence of certain observations as proof that a given hypothesis is false, we presuppose the existence of certain conditions. Now, that's a bit enigmatic and not as precise and pointed an explanation as one might hope for. So here's a particular example where that's true. Think about the discovery of Neptune. One of the wonderful results of Newtonian mechanics is all of the things that they were able to use Newtonian mechanics to give us an understanding of after Newton first developed his four laws of motion. So they were doing all sorts of good things, figuring out all sorts of stuff. And one thing that they tried to do was predict where to see planets in the night sky. Where should Venus be found? Where should Mars? Jupiter, where should all these planets be found? And it turns out you could calculate using Newtonian mechanics where the planets were supposed to be. So they did this for Venus, predicted where Venus was supposed to be in the night sky, and then looked and Venus wasn't anywhere close. It wasn't like a small observation error that was being made. It wasn't even remotely close where the theory predicted it to be. So you'd think, look, that just means Newtonian mechanics was just confuted by experience, falsified by experience. The theory predicted the planet was supposed to be at a certain spot. We looked, it wasn't there. So Newtonian mechanics is faulty. I don't know of any historical figure that drew that conclusion. What they did instead was they said, well, we're making certain presuppositions when we make our calculations. This is standardly referred to as an auxiliary hypothesis. So you were making assumptions about what the major large bodies were in the heavens that were exerting gravitational forces on Venus. That's an assumption you were making. It's not part of Newtonian mechanics at all. So instead what they said is, I guess our auxiliary assumptions must be mistaken. There must be another body that we can't see that has a certain size and is responsible for the variance between where we predicted Venus should be and where it actually is. So you can use Newtonian mechanics to calculate how big this object is, where it should be, and we can't see it, so we're gonna to need to build a bigger telescope, and that's what Galileo did. That's how Neptune was discovered. So notice what he's saying is correct. There is a holistic character to refutation in that any refutation presupposes other assumptions being made. And when you get 
experience contrary to what you were expecting, you have two choices to make. Well, depends on how many assumptions you've got. It's sort of like a reductio argument in logic. So you've got four premises and you show that they imply a contradiction. Which premise is at fault? Well, deriving the contradiction doesn't tell you anything at all about that. It could be any of the premises. The same is true here. When experience goes contrary to what you were expecting or anticipating, you don't know whether the hypothesis being tested is mistaken or whether some of the other assumptions you were making are the ones that are at fault. So that's the, that's the line Air takes against falsificationism. He could have also used the other one. Falsification is the mirror of verification. So if verification has trouble with negative existentials, falsification is going to have trouble with positive existentials, and so on. In any case, Ayer is rather dismissive about falsificationism making any advance over verificationism. As a result of the arguments against verificationism, we endorse the weaker sense in the vague formulations above, and then he pursues alternative formulations. It's the mark of a genuine factual proposition, not that it should be equivalent to an experiential proposition. Notice here he's admitting that scientific theories outrun even the complete conjunction of the empirical consequences of the theory. Take all of them or even any finite number of experiential propositions, but simply that some can be deduced from it in conjunction with other certain other premises without being deducible from those premises alone. So notice this is the explicit affirmation that confirmation, even in the weak sense, is the mirror image of entailment. So you've got to look at what can be deduced and then he applies it to various metaphysical debates. And he points out, you can't deduce anything about experience from these metaphysical positions. Monism, pluralism, realism, idealism, whether the world outside the mind is an illusion. I don't know which we, we should call that. Maybe fictionalism? Probably not. Fictionalism has a defined sense that isn't what this is expressing. So we probably should, we probably need illusionism. I don't know what we should call it. In any case, the close relationship between the empirical, the a posteriori, and the non-tautological is what's central to Ayer's discussion here. That's the positivistic epistemology in summary form that I began with, with the color chart. A nice quote. First, Air is a phenomenalist. It turns out you don't have to be a phenomenalist. There are debates about this within the camp of the logical positivist and logical empiricist. But here, Air opts for phenomenalism. But from the fact that we happen to employ a single word to refer to a thing and make that word the grammatical subject of the sentences in which we refer to the sensible appearances of the thing, it doesn't by any means follow that the thing itself is a simple entity or that it can't be defined in terms of the totality of its appearances. So he's talking about things like simple material object statements, the tree in my front yard. The fact that we have such a singular term and say all sorts of things about the tree in my front yard doesn't by itself show that we can't define the tree in terms of the totality of its appearances. So think here of George Barclay. A material object, a physical object, is just a collection of, of sensations or appearances of the thing. It's true that in talking of its appearances, we appear to distinguish the thing from the appearances, but that is simply an accident of linguistic usage. Logical analysis shows that what makes these appearances, the appearances of the same thing, is not their relationship to an entity other than themselves, but their relationship to one another.
this is a remarkable claim about what logical analysis is going to show. Uh, I have no idea how that's supposed to work. It's a bit reminiscent of Royce claiming that it's a matter of pure dry logic that idealism is true. People like to appeal to the logical character of the views that they hold when it's often not clear at all how in the world that could be a matter of logic alone. So, but in any case, that's what Ayer is endorsing, a form of phenomenalism where we explain ordinary material object statements in terms of collections of appearance statements. He then endorses something that we saw in Frege and can be traced to Kant, that the consequences of this view is that existence isn't a predicate. Even though martyrs suffer and martyrs exist, have the same surface grammar. This simply repeats a point that goes back all the way to Moore and Russell. Logical form and surface grammatical form are not the same thing. In any case, we can summarize, or we'll use Ayer's own language for the summation of his position. But as far as we are concerned, the distinction between the kind of metaphysics that is produced by a philosopher who has been duped by grammar and the kind that is produced by a mystic who is trying to express the inexpressible is of no great importance. What's important to us is to realize that even the utterances of the metaphysician who is attempting to expound a vision are literally senseless, so that henceforth we may pursue our philosophical researches with as little regard for them as for the more inglorious kind of metaphysics which comes from a failure to understand the workings of our language. So, Ayer is rejoicing that we don't need to attend to metaphysics anymore. And there are derisive quotes and discussions about things that metaph metaphysicians sometimes say. One of my favorites is the discussion of Heidegger. I think this is the quote. The nothing nots itself. Where nots, it looks like I might have misspelled, but this is negation turned into a verb. The term that we use as in, he is not a villain, turned into a verb. So Heidegger did that. There's nothing wrong with this rhetorical device. There's actually a term for it, hendiadis. It was known to the, as far back as when Aristotle and the Greeks talked about rhetorical strategies in general. The strategy of Hendiadus is well known. We see it, there's a famous book from the, from the 1990s complaining about this rhetorical strategy. The title of it is The Verbing of America. Well, verb, the word verb is a noun. And so the title of the book engages in the practice that it's complaining about. I think that's, um, intentionally ironic, but it was complaining that we should quit doing that, let words be what they are, and quit morphing them into something that they're not. In any case, the nothing knots itself engages in an example of hendiatus, but I still have no idea what the sentence is supposed to mean, and Ayer says that's good. It doesn't mean anything. It conveys no sense at all. It is literally a senseless expression, and so we can just throw all of this out. This traces back to something Hume wrote in his treatise where he said, go to your favorite library. He said something along these lines. Go to your favorite library. Does it contain any good science? Is it investing, investigating empirically anything at all? If so, that's good. Is it engaged in the abstract reasoning of mathematics? If it is, good. If neither of these two consign it to the flames, because it's a waste of everybody's time, the difference is with the logical empiricists, with the positivists, what you got was a linguistic explanation as to why you should burn books like this. You should burn them because they literally don't say anything at all. They have no semantic content of any sort. They are senseless or meaningless. And so that's what's wrong with them. Okay, that's the background of positivistic epistemology at a very general level. and. Ayer's particular popularization of it in language, truth, and logic in the 1930s.
after facing the problem of the principle of verificationism, what is the status of this principle itself, Ayer published a second edition of Language, Truth, and Logic. And in the preface to the second volume, he addressed this question. What is the status of the principle of verification itself? Is it an empirically significant claim, or is it an analytic truth? And Ayer decided both of those answers were bad answers. And so he said, here's the proper way to understand the principle. It's a recommendation for how we should talk. That means the principle of verification is not itself a claim that's either true or false. It's just air comes in and says, I'd like to invite you to dinner and I'd like you to wear a coat and tie and always keep the fork in your left hand while you eat. That's a recommendation. After his dinner invitation, he says, and now when it comes to the way you think and talk and speak, I prefer that you think and talk and speak in terms that satisfy my principle of verification. Both of those are recommendations. Recommendations do not have a truth value. They can be accepted or rejected, but they're not theoretically significant. That looks like it's a very sad day if you're a verificationist, that you now have to treat this roughly as a matter of custom. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. When with a positivist, talk and speak like positivists do, please. We will like you much better and we'll have a better time together if you do this. One would hope that there's a better response to the problem for the principle of verification than that. In any case, we'll turn in the next lecture to the Vienna Circle, the sources of positivism and a bit of the history of it.